Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm here with Julie Oliver, um, congressional candidate for Texas 25. Julie, how are you? I am healthy and well. I am very healthy and I'm grateful that right now our family is free of illness, you know, sheltering in place, but we are all healthy. And, and I'm hopeful that I never take that that status again for granted because it actually is quite meaningful right now. Absolutely. I want to start on a really positive note. I mean, what has been bringing you joy during during this time? Oh my God. You want, do you want me to be honest? Yes, always. <laughs> so since we've been at home and I'm going to tell you, being at home is very, a very different campaigning at home is a very different experience than campaigning on the road. So every day we've gotten in the, in the habit of making cookies at three o'clock. Um, and it is funny because I still have my 21 year old daughter who lives in a garage apartment behind us. I have an 11 year old daughter who um, is finishing up fifth grade and I kid you not, at three o'clock, they start circling like, where are the cookies? But we're baking cookies every day. And um, that's, I think that's probably been my favorite thing. And it really, it, I'm not going to lie, y'all, cookies are my favorite dessert. They always have been. And um, it brings me a lot of joy. Just that little simple thing of smelling cookies and then eating them afterwards. And sharing. I love that so, so much. And yeah. that it's so consistent as well. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, you have been hosting a lot of online town halls and I know um, I appreciate it as like a cons future constituent, but I wanna ask folks to please comment with any questions you have. And like, Julie, what are you seeing in the community right now? And, and what are, how are you connecting folks with resources? So we decided early on, you know, I think um, our family started sheltering in place March 13th. It was Friday the 13th and we, my husband and I kind of took a step back that weekend and I was like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? I can't go out. I can't travel. We were planning a 13 county district wide tour. And so we, we kind of just virtually uh, met with our team and, and brainstormed, what do we do? And we decided we were going to start calling folks and texting them just to see how they were doing. No campaign ask, no, hey, will you vote for Julie? We did mention we're, you know, with Julie Oliver running for Congress, but um, how are you? Are you okay? Do you have everything you need? And I will say, I'm, I am grateful that the majority of people we call really actually are, uh, they're healthy, they still have jobs, um, they're okay, they're managing, but there are several that we call who don't have that luxury, that they lost their jobs, still don't have um, their unemployment benefits. Many people haven't gotten their stimulus checks. Some some folks are senior citizens in the rural parts of our community and um, don't have family that live nearby them. So they really do need assistance with groceries and even picking up medications, um, rental assistance, you name it. So we're, we're hearing from folks uh, across District 25 and, and how this coronavirus, I called somebody the other day and she's like, now is not a good time. I'm actually waiting for my coronavirus results. I thought you were calling with them. And, um, and so, you know, trying to early on, there was, there was a lot of, I think, panic about where can I get tested and tests were such limited availability. And you had to have that very, you had to fall into that very strict, you know, category of, do you have a fever? Can you, do you have difficulty breathing? Do you have a cough? And were you exposed to somebody who had a known, who was a known carrier of coronavirus? So uh, thankfully that's, we've actually gotten more testing over the weeks that have passed. Um, but I will say coronavirus is not letting up in Texas. I, I think it's, you know, quite frankly, a, a little irresponsible to open up our communities, even in a limited fashion, knowing that the cases are rising and um, the deaths are continuing to rise. And I think it was modeled, you know, a while ago that we haven't even hit our peak. So it's that's what we have been doing. That's how we have pivoted. We actually created a resource guide as well that can be found on our website. Um, it's, it's county specific. So some of it's state and local or state and uh, federal information, but there's county specific information, especially when it comes to rental assistance or, uh, or food assistance, you know, county by county, location by location. What is that looking like? And I know this district spans a large swath of land and and you said it's it's 13 counties and so it's it's quite a large district and I know some of that has to do with gerrymandering as well but when you're talking to folks you know across this district 
what are some of the concerns that are different between the, the areas and what are the ones that like span, no matter where you go, people are concerned about this? I, I would say, honestly, uh, healthcare is a universal issue for everybody. And it doesn't matter if somebody is living in rural Texas, has a hospital that is at risk of closure because the funding isn't available for it. Um, and, and even while we, you know, a lot of rural Texas has a lot of senior citizens who are in Medicare, which is a universal health care for them, if they don't have facilities that are close to them. So it, it's strange because health care in rural Texas access is a lot of the issue. It's not only health care coverage because there's a high uninsured population in rural Texas, but it's also access. It's having doctors living in the communities. It's having a, a hospital that is not at risk of closing that can continue to meet at least emergent needs and do normal testing that you would have in, in hospitals. Um, so healthcare is universal, but I, you know, as you go from kind of the north part of the district down to the southern part of the district, you know, in, in Johnson County, uh, I don't know if you recall the Louis Vuitton plant visit that the president went to last year. Um, that got a, a permit from the TCEQ to discharge their uh, water into the wastewater system and their chemicals are proprietary. So nobody knows what's in the chemicals that they're discharging. The, the chemicals or the water eventually gets um, discharged and it makes its way into the drinking water supply. And um, so that's a huge concern for the folks who live there, having clean water. Um, in Marble Falls, uh, having clean air, there's a rock crushing quarry there that releases silica in the air, which is a harmful inhalant. And the city of Marble Falls was actually successful in stopping the rock crushing quarry from doing that until the state stepped in and said, you, you don't have the authority to do that. Um, if I know, right? If you're in Colleen and Copperas Cove, two areas that uh, serve the, you know, filled with military families, retired military or current military, because Fort Hood is based there, or the post is is between kind of the two towns. Um, education and veterans benefits are huge. Having veterans disability claims met in a timely fashion. But because there are so many veterans there who, who do have disability uh, status and have the exemption from property taxes um, due to that status, and we pay our property, I mean, we pay school, we fund schools, I should say, through property taxes, they're heavily dependent on a federal program called impact aid. And Impact Aid has been consistently cut under this administration with the blessing of our current representative who, who is not fighting for the schools and for the funding for the schools in those communities. Um, Hayes County to the south, they have, you have a pipeline cutting through private property. Um, a company is using eminent domain claims to cut through ranches and private property just to connect the Permian Basin to the um, to the Gulf. And again, it's another reason we need to move to renewable resources. Uh, and I, I think it, it's remarkable. We do have Fort Hood in our district. We have so many men and women who are coming out of Fort Hood. They do their two years at Fort Hood and they have this remarkable talent, mechanical talent. Wouldn't it be great to redeploy them and put them into the green energy space and actually create an economy in central Texas uh, of solar farms? There's a lot of land in, in our district between um, here and Tarrant County that would be ideal for solar farms and redeploying our military men and women and retired military into high paying jobs that are is skilled labor, I think could be a huge boon to the economies of um, Coriel County and Bell County. So, Absolutely. And thank you so much for that rundown. I think your knowledge of the district is, is so apparent. Um, I want to come back to healthcare a little bit because I know that's where your expertise and your background is in. What are some of the healthcare measures that you want to fight for? I know you support Medicare for all um, and measures similar to that. Um, what is needed right now? What is not being done? And what would you do in November? Oh, my goodness. Okay, so what could we do right now? We could actually quite literally right now expand Medicaid in the state, but that would require leadership at the highest levels of the state. And we don't have that. Mm -hmm. Instead, we're stuck with Governor Abbott and Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, who have such an incredible hostility to providing health care to people, even though it would lower our costs. It would lower our costs because, again, we pay for health care in Texas. Uh, I tell people all the time, we have universal health care across the United States. It's called our emergency room. But in Texas, we pay for that with our property taxes and through our insurance premium. So if we immediately wanted to lower our property taxes, we should expand Medicaid. We have sent $100 billion to other states 
who are happily taking up uh, Texan taxpayer money and, and reducing their cost. We could be doing the same, but they fail to demonstrate leadership and, um, and it's apparent. We uh, have the highest uninsured rate in the United States, about one, and, and this was pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic, we had about one in five and a half people who were uninsured, 800,000 children in Texas who are uninsured. And so um, I think at a minimum, that's what we could do immediately right now. And the governor has the authority to do that. Mm -hmm. I would love to see paid sick days as part of our health care pro uh, uh, program. I would love to see mental health care as part of our, our federal universal health care. And you're right. I, I do support Medicare for all because one, Medicare, there's no profit there. And the salaries are not uh, the salaries that you see in the private health care insurance uh, world. United Healthcare posted its largest profit quarter ever, the first quarter, in the middle of a pandemic, $500 billion in profits. And the highest paid healthcare CEO gets the equivalent of $225,000 every day. That's that's his compensation, $225,000 a day. We don't pay our teachers $225,000 a year. <laughs> Yet a, a man who works for a health insurance company who's not doing anything to innovate in the healthcare world, um, if anything is taking away from the healthcare world, gets paid two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a day. Now put that, let stew on that just for a while. We're paying for that in our healthcare. So yeah, Medicare for all makes sense. We can lower healthcare costs, and we can also um, increase our outcome. I mean, our outcomes are the worst in the in the developed uh, world. And we could improve outcomes, decrease costs. It's a win-win, and Texas stands to win the most. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I think what you're saying about expanding Medicaid right now. Um, I know sickofittexas.org is doing some wonderful work on that, um, and it just takes one signature from the governor, like you said. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. it, and, and and he's either feigning ignorance in the area. Or he, or he is ignorant and really needs an education. And I am happy to spend some time with him and share my healthcare finance expertise. And maybe we can get some sensible healthcare policies in, in Texas that actually save us money and save lives. Absolutely. So if you have it, if you're up for it, I'm available. My number's on my website. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I hope he gives you a call and that you record it and, and share it with your folks who follow you. I'm not going to be holding my breath, but if he did call and ask me for a tutorial, I'd be happy, happy to share it with him and give him the knowledge of why it's a fis fiscally responsible thing to do if he needs to sell that to his, his base. Absolutely. Yeah. I know we talked a little bit um, before we went live about the economy here in Texas Folks, some folks are getting stimulus checks. Um, some small business have been able to get PPP dollars, but it is it is so hard for folks right now. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what Roger Williams, the incumbent, is doing right now and mm -hmm. what needs to be done for small businesses and for everyday Texans? Right. Um, yes, I can tell you exactly what Roger Williams is doing right now. He, he got PPP for his car dealership outside of the district. He lives and his car dealership is outside of District 25. Um, and he sits on the uh, the House Financial Services Committee. Um, he's got great relationships with bankers. So front of the line got his car dealership um, PPE. And he says that, you know, he needed to ensure that his employees continued receiving their paychecks. And I don't doubt that. He is the 12th uh, wealthiest congressman. Uh, in the United States uh, Rep House of Representatives, but his wife and his daughters are also on on payroll at his car dealership, and he hasn't answered questions about whether they are getting if. Okay, look, we already pay his salary. Taxpayers pay Roger Williams' salaries, and he doesn't do anything for our district. I want to know if taxpayers are paying for his wife and his daughter's salaries when he took the PPP, and he won't explain where the money went. He won't say what he did with it. And he's been asked by by newspapers, but he he ignores that question. He's very good at dodging answers. Um, but my question is: Is his wife and are his daughters the beneficiary of PPP through him stepping into the first place in line to ensure that he got it? And you know, this is a man who has railed. He has made it his um, his mission in Congress to rail on on social programs. 
Yet who was the first one to stand in line when, when he voted in favor of the largest social program this country has ever seen in the CARES Act? So what do we need in another stimulus program? We need to help small businesses. And I think we should define small businesses as, as revenue, not necessarily employees, but revenue. Um, uh, I also think that we should have a moratorium, truly a moratorium on rent and mortgage and credit payments across the board, across the board, because if you are renting or if you own a home that you're paying a mortgage on, the underlying asset is there. It's not going anywhere. It's still there. It still has value. Um, put a moratorium on rent and mortgage. And, and I, I understand that that could be harder for some people who own a home that they are renting out and they're not these large landlords, but put a moratorium even on their, um, their mortgage payments for the home that they, the asset that they own. And, um, you know, for people who are still struggling to even making a car payment, you know, the car is still there. Just put a, a moratorium till we can see what it looks like to get through to the other side. And, and, you know, I will say that Governor Abbott, Roger Williams, Donald Trump all have, um, you know, failed miserably in the response to this pandemic. There were certain steps we could have taken five months ago to save lives and save our economy that they failed to take. And they're doing everything they can to, you know, smoke and mirrors, cover up the fact that their their response has been an utter failure and really, and now has cost over 70,000 lives. And there doesn't seem to be any remorse. We have failed to properly um, protect healthcare workers who are on the front lines, who are sac literally sacrificing their lives and their families' lives to take care of patients with coronavirus, they've done nothing. So what did they do? They create these little phony stories. Um, they, they enrage a certain base. They throw red meat at a certain base who um, go and do silly things like rally at the Capitol without masks. They hold up a woman in North Dallas, a North Dallas suburbanite um, as a martyr. She's anything but a martyr. She ripped up a judge's orders and, and failed to heed them. I think when um, Martin Luther King didn't uh, follow judge's orders, he was put in jail. Nobody, you know, uh, no governor was there trying to get him out of jail, but a white woman in jail? No, that is that is absolutely reprehensible. We couldn't possibly have that. And, and you know, meanwhile, Crystal Mason, a, a black woman who voted on probation, got five years in prison five years in prison, taken away from her children um, because she was honest about being on probation and, and uh, voted. So, um, you know, the leadership or lack thereof at the federal and state level is just truly astounding. The only leadership I've seen demonstrated is at a local level. And whether that's here in Austin, Travis County, or even up in Johnson County, local leadership is doing the right thing. It's state and federal that is failing miserable, miserably. Thank you. Thank you for like, yeah, sharing all of that. Um, during your kind of overview of the district, you talked a little bit about a lot of the environmental concerns that yeah. some of our, our neighbors are facing here. Um, what is what is the future of Texas when it comes to green energy and how do we transition that and bring these folks who like work in the oil industry with us in that fight? Well, you know, Texas has been for over a hundred years, uh, a leader, world leader, you know, honestly, in, in energy, but we're going to be the world leader in clean energy. And we do have to have a just transition. That's what the Green New Deal is all about. It is a just transition for the workers in the oil fields and working on the pipelines and working at refineries on the coast. And imagine redeploying them. We, you know, um, a thousand miles of coastline in Texas, we could put windmills on. Imagine redeploying them um, to work on windmills. Again, high, high paying, high skilled labor, um, union jobs. We could absolutely redeploy them. And again, I keep thinking about this amazing talent that we get out of the military. And instead of sending our men and women um, to foreign lands to fight for oil, knowing that there is certain, um, absolutely certain death for, for some of the soldiers who are deployed overseas, why not redeploy them here in Texas and, and in the solar energy? And there's even, there's so much that's possible when it comes to green energy, even wave energy, harnessing the waves that come on our shoreline with ex existing infrastructure that's already in the Gulf. Um, we can be, we can continue to be a leader. We can, can, we can transition the workers from the oil and gas industry 
directly over to green energy industry. But the, the people that don't want that to happen are the executives in the oil and gas industry because they make so much money and they buy politicians left and right. We need campaign finance reform. We needed it yesterday um, because they're willing, they have the ability to, and, and they do write checks of ungodly sums to keep congressmen and women and senators and, and presidents um, happily entrapped in this cycle of, of keeping us dependent on oil. And, it's, it's something our future depends on us transitioning away from oil and we have to do it sooner rather than later. We can, um, you know, here's here's a stat. We subsidize the oil and gas industry for, for the Republicans out there who say, you know, let the free markets work. Well, OK, let the free markets work in oil and gas. Let's see how how long that lasts. We will be at ten dollar gallon gas very, very quickly. If free markets were truly at play. But we don't. We subsidize it billions, hundreds of billions of dollars a year annually. And our, our taxpayer dollars are, are subsidizing it. Why don't we re redeploy those in the green energy space? And I guarantee you innovation will will crop up in um, the green energy space. Things that we haven't even thought of yet will become possible because you've you've incentivized people to to invest there. So I think there are a lot of things that we can do and we can get there much quicker than um than even I think some experts think we can get there by by redeploying where we put our investment and our and our subsidies. Absolutely, and I want to think we've got a few comments. Some folks are tuning in from New York. Folks from Lubbock, um, welcome. Laura asked, like, how could Governor Abbott not be tuned into this chat? I love that. If anyone <laughs> has any questions, please drop them in the chat, and we will get to them. Julie, I, we talked a little bit about how your campaign has gone online and how your life has changed. Um, how can folks continue to connect with you during this pandemic? Yeah, so we um, we uh, everything is virtual, obviously. So we do roundtables, we do town halls. Um, I do a nightly check-in. If the video is too long, it doesn't go on Twitter, but I try to make it short enough that it can go on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Um, but I do kind of a little nightly check-in. Uh, we also are, you know, if people want to get involved in volunteering and, and checking on you, and you can do that from anywhere. You could do that from New York. So, um, uh, calling in and checking on folks in Congressional District 25 and ensuring that they have their basic needs met. And if they don't, allowing us, you know, giving us permission to help them is a great way to get involved in campaigns. And it takes the politics out of it. It really does. Um, it, this isn't, you know, these are not political calls. They really are well check calls. And uh, yeah, so we have an events page on our website, julieoliver.org. And you can find all of our events there. Um, we also have a Facebook page, Twitter page, Instagram page, uh, YouTube page. We, Whenever we stream, because I realize that not everybody has access to social media. So, um, and a lot of people just absolutely hate Facebook. So we also, whenever we do any of these events, we, we stream it on our website as well. So any of the round tables and um, um, town halls, we do those on our website. And I will say we have a climate uh, change Roundtable coming up. I'm very excited about that one. It's uh, uh, led or one of our panelists is a man that I got to meet during this last election cycle. He works in the renewable battery space and in large scale battery space. And he is it's he's just like listening to an amazing college professor that you don't want class to end. That'll be May 18th. So I would love to have people join in and we'll have one on the census um, that's coming up and how important the census is in completing it and the federal dollars that are allocated and congressional seats that are allocated to Texas is all based on the completion of the census. So plug for the census. If you haven't done it yet, it takes less than five minutes. Please complete the census. Julie, you, you are a wealth of knowledge and, and your passion really shows like what is keeping you driven right now to to continue running this race? Well, you know, it's it changes. Um, some days I have to draw inspiration from um, different things. A lot of times I remember why I got in this race to begin with. It was my son who suffers from a lot of health care conditions. And I think about, I remember, oh my gosh, he had a little six-year-old kid getting an electrophysiology study. And I don't know if y'all know what that is. That's where they thread probes through the arteries or veins in your neck and one through your groin, they, they map out your heart. So they take them to your heart. A little six-year-old child, and he was so brave. Um, he's 23 now. I'm sure he, he 
probably does not appreciate me talking about how cute he was as a little boy, but he was so cute, y'all, he was so cute. Um, no, but I'll tell you, one of the things that has given me the most inspiration right now is a young woman who we, we checked on, uh, who was an ER nurse here in, in Austin, who was reusing her PPE, her protective equipment, uh, putting it in a styrofoam box, her mask in a styrofoam box, putting it in her locker and having to reuse it shift after shift. Because again, at the federal level, we failed to, um, create a federal stockpile and streamline the supply chain. So our healthcare workers were left without PPE and many of the hospitals and, and doctor's offices were left scrambling and paying three to five times, six times as much as what it would normally be. And we were able to connect her with um, the Austin Chinese uh, American network who gave her 10 N95 masks. And she wrote me just, just such an incredible email. It was beautiful. And she said, Julie, um, this gave me renewed hope in humanity. And she goes, you might think this is crazy, but I'm going to go to New Jersey to ground zero and help folks in the ER there um, take care of coronavirus patients. When I think about her courage, when I think about her self-sacrifice, that to me is a definition of a hero. And if she can go do that, then I can do this really easy. No problem. Thank you so much for sharing that. We have a question from Logan here on what is the biggest obstacle that your campaign has that is not COVID related, um, regardless of whether or not there was a pandemic? Yeah, what's this biggest obstacle? Um, you know, I think it's a couple things. I think, you know, from the 2018 cycle, this was a race that was not considered winnable. I mean, it wasn't. Most people, um, it failed to, to think that congressional district because of its length and its size and, and the fact that it was actually intentionally carved uh, for Roger Williams when he was secretary of state and he wanted his own congressional seat, um, that it wasn't winnable. And our team, I, and I just say we were scrappy, we were grassroots, we were doing it DIY. And I mean, it was like a, a punk rock, you know, tour, um, music tour. And, uh, we moved this district 12 percentage points and in a district that was never considered to be anything but 60, 40 in favor of, of the Republican. And we got it down to single digits and we're going to do it this year. And I think that it still gets uh, written off, but people don't understand the work behind the scenes and, and the work that this team, the, you know, the full-time staffers on our team do the part-time staffers on our team and the work of the volunteers, we are committed and we are going to flip this district in, in 2020 in November, Roger Williams will be going home to Weatherford, Texas in congressional district 12, where Kate Granger can be his Congresswoman. Um, and I think that part of that challenge is uh, sometimes the fundraising aspect. You got to think about this is a small business. It really is. It's we have staff, we have um, software, we have compliance uh, people who keep us make it, to ensure that we don't do anything outside of the federal guidelines for elections. And it is. It's like running a small business, um, except you know, the CEO is a volunteer, and. Um, so I would say, Logan, that that's probably the biggest challenge is one, getting it, getting national attention for it. And two, sometimes contributions. And I don't want to put anybody in a bind, right? Especially right now, it's a pandemic. And so I don't like asking for contributions unless somebody has the ability to. And if they have the, the ability to, then they really do need to invest in this campaign because we are going to win in November. And we have incredible strategists behind the scenes. Um, who are taking a very data-driven approach to this. And this is a winnable district. It is, and, and we are gonna do it. Thank you, Julie. What, I wanna end on another positive note. What is something that you're looking forward to? Oh, goodness. What am I looking forward to? Um, <laughs> well, I am looking for, oh, I got, I got one. My 21-year-old um, daughter is graduating college, and I am looking forward to, um, we'll have a, a virtual graduation for her, but it's also at the same time as her older sister turning 30. And, um, you know, I guess I'm going to be excited when she is, you know, kind of on her own and has a job and you know, she can live behind us. I don't mind. She lives in a garage apartment behind us, but, um, you know, it's going to be nice is when she is making some money. <laughs> no, no, I look forward to, we're going to win this district. We're absolutely going to do it. I look forward to, I, you know, 
you know, a day when we can rebuild our economy and keep uh, citizens safe because we have elected leaders who actually care about doing the right thing. Wonderful. Absolutely. With you in this fight, Julie. Thank you. Um, thank, you. thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we so appreciate it. And thank you to everyone for watching and joining. Um, we'll hear more from you soon, Julie, I am sure. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Bye, y'all.